You don't need to. Your ATM is safe. Your banks are safe. There's enough cash in the financial system, and there is an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. We will do whatever we need to do to make sure that there's enough cash in the banking system. Stop us. I am Jeff Cliff. This is my weekly broadcast to the world, my weekly podcast, my weekly show to give those of you out there on the internet and possibly in other media a glimpse into the world as I see it and as an alternative to the MPAA, the RIA, Netflix, Gormley, and other corporate media. And this is a weekly show. Unfortunately, for those of you paying attention, you may not have heard or noticed a show a week ago and it wasn't because there wasn't a show this unfortunately is due to the fact that my recording setup for that particular show failed miserably on me i have three recording devices that i could draw on to use in this show and all three of them failed uh, I needed two of them to connect to guests. I actually had two guests last week. And then, unfortunately, the third device I had, my MP3 player, I think I figured out what is wrong with it. I have uh, someone who has this sealant that they use for all electronics in their life. And they offer to spray this down with the sealant. And I've noticed that ever since they've done that, the microphone just isn't working and so it must be like a solid state microphone or something small enough that much sealant over top of it just muffles all sound completely that's at least my working hypothesis so i had to get a, another recording device so that i could get a backup in case facebook doesn't work and Callie, uh, Callie Mist uh, from one of the previous shows, stepped up in a big way and lent me hers. So if we are hearing this on the internet uh, and Facebook is not recording it, we have Callie to thank for that. So thank you, Callie, so much for that. Uh, by the way, you can catch her on Spaced Out Radio on the 31st at 10 p.m. That's at least 10 p.m. here in Saskatoon time. Spaced Out Radio is at spacedoutradio.com. It sounds kind of interesting. It's, it's probably going to be more of the same sort of thing uh, she was talking about on my show uh, a couple of weeks ago, or I guess a couple of months ago now. Uh, so if you enjoyed that show or uh, would like to hear some of her uh, ideas about the world, uh, you can tune into that later on this week. So other than that, though, what has been going on? Well, I have been self-isolated this week and last week. So I am getting a little bit batty. I am actually out of self-isolation as of today, and I did indeed leave my apartment for the first time in well over a week. Got to see a little bit of the sunrise and the quiet streets uh, with practically no activity in them in a uh, quarantined Saskatoon. Uh, there were a couple of people out and about, one person walking in the whole uh, bike ride that I went through, as well as a couple of people driving around. So it seemed, at least from my perspective, in the very brief period of time that I was out and about, that people in Saskatoon are taking COVID-19 serious, which they 
right well should. It is spreading all over the world. And just as I mentioned last week, it is becoming a major global event. It is. It has been for a good couple of weeks, but it is really hitting home now. We have, I'm just going to check the numbers for the future so they can, can keep track of where we are in this global pandemic right now. And as of right at this moment, uh, at least according to John Hopkins University's data, the total confirmed is over 718,000 people uh, with 33,881 deaths. And more important than that is the graph of new cases continues to be exponential. And it continues to be, or at least if not exponential, then something like quadratic or cubic, something increasing at a very rapid rate. It does seem like here in Canada, uh, specifically, the exponential has been broken a little bit and that our social distancing measures of uh, closing the schools, closing the bars and restaurants, and ending, I, I think we're down to five people here in Saskatchewan. I'm not sure the, the number, they keep lowering it. I know some provinces, I think it was Alberta might still be at 15 people or, or less for all social gatherings. And just generally, the, the government, not just here in Saskatoon, not just here in Canada, but all over the world, governments are restricting and people's ability to meet and get together into groups and generally doing all kinds of measures and, and enacting all kinds of laws and restrictions and uh, countermeasures against this virus to try to slow it, to try to stop it. And it is still to be seen what will work effectively and what won't. Uh, South Korea still, well, let's actually just click on that right now, their numbers are, are still looking good, not great. Uh, their increase has been linear for a while, but it's still increasing there. So they haven't got it under control, although it's much more in control in South Korea than it is here. And then, of course, North Korea is still more or less completely in control because every time someone gets it, they shoot them. So that's a little extreme. I'd hope that we don't do that here. But it's interesting to know. But there are a couple of interesting reactions that governments have been making, that some of which are directly involved in the economic aftermath of this global pandemic, and then others where the connection between the two are, are kind of is kind of weak. And it's not really clear how what the government is doing is actually going to help. So in this, the, the first example, which I, I played a little clip at the beginning of the show, is from, uh, let's see where, I guess they don't have the guy's name, but he's one of the people from the Federal Reserve of the United States. And he actually said in, in this clip on 60 Minutes that the U.S. Federal Reserve is, quote, uh, or is willing to use a, quote, infinite amount, unquote, of cash. And... Unfortunately, the, the last show, the show that was lost, we actually went into a little bit of the details of how the U.S. Federal Reserve actually manages to do this. But the important thing to note here is that the, the number is not limited. And that is actually something kind of new historically. Governments and, and central banks are willing to intervene in markets, and they are willing to intervene in a big way. Uh, and for the past two weeks, we've been seeing something like a trillion dollars a day being thrown into the giant hole that is the stock market right now. And it's, to some extent, maybe a work to keep more of a, a Great Depression-like financial crisis from happening. But even with that, the St. Louis Federal Reserve is, is suggesting that the United States gross domestic product is going to drop by about half. Now, half of a drop in GDP is an extreme drop. It is hard to express how extreme that is, but one of the important things to note is that when governments like the United States and Canada go and do their budgeting and finance for the end of the year, they will, or a lot of the time, uh, people will justify having a debt, having de deficit spending on the basis that, oh, it's a small proportion of our GDP or a small proportion of the well, total economic activity in this country. And so we can get away with kicking the can down the road on paying for our, our current spending for whatever the government is trying to spend money on because it's it's proportionally still only a small part of our yearly economic uh, work. Now, what has happened in the States now is that that ratio, that relationship between how much they kind of expect the whole of the economy to work and to produce versus how much they borrowed is now totally bonkers. It's totally off and off in a huge way. And 
it's not just going to be the states. It's not just going to be Donald Trump and his inability to pass a, a balanced budget through the Senate and the House. It's this is going to happen here as well. This is going to spread, uh, or these these economic troubles, but it's not going to be confined to the states. Some so, uh, a drop that big will not be confined to the American economy. It will not be confined to the American stock market. It can only spread across the world. So this is going to leave a wave, a tsunami of a wave, through the economic system of the world. And again, it's worth pointing out that the, the NDP long-term policy of not having deficit spending is exactly for this kind of situation. Because now we're going to be faced with a situation where our government is not going to have the money. And the only way that it can get the money is through what this video just suggested, printing the money. And printing money in a situation like this is a it's, it's not just a recipe for inflation, uh, period. It is another thing that is going to completely distort the market. And one way of kind of seeing how that distortion happens, and I don't know how to actually pronounce his name because I've only seen it in print, but uh, one of the U.S. former presidential candidates, uh, Andrew Young, pointed out that the American public is getting starting to notice with the current stimulus bill that was either just passed or is getting close to being just passed, that just spent two trillion dollars. And the question is, well, where did that tr two trillion dollars come from? And the, the American public is starting to clue in that, oh, this kind of money can be conjured into existence if the banking system needs it. So why not do something more useful with it, right? But on, on some level, though, the illusion is starting to break down of, of who gets to control the creation of money and the creation of value in the United States. And it, it is going to lead to really, really bizarre consequences as we kind of go forward. But I did just want to kind of point it out that the Federal Reserve is literally willing to create an infinite amount of money. And when you do that, the value of that money literally drops to zero. Like, that's taking... I haven't really gotten into limits enough to express why that works, but that is what they're talking about. They're, they're talking about not just breaking the American dollar's hegemony over the, the global trade, and not just breaking the, the value of the dollar for its trading partners and the, the relationship between their currency and our currencies here and all that. So they're literally talking about driving the value to zero and making it worthless. That is what they're talking about. If you have money in the bank, that's the sort of thing that you should probably start to be worried about in a way that you wouldn't have had to have worried up until this week. It was unthinkable that the U.S. government or the U.S. Federal Reserve would drive the value to zero a week ago, and yet here we are today. So that's what's going on on the economic side. As far as the COVID side, let's see what else have I got here. So this is a link from uh, ProPublica. Uh, so one of the first places that got hit in North America was the western United States, the northwestern United States. So Oregon, I think Washington up there. And so this is from their experience. And I'm just going to read a little bit of it. You'll get the idea very quickly here. So, quote, expired respirators, reused masks, nurses in the nation's original COVID-19 epicenter offer sobering accounts of what could come. Quote, when nurses at one Washington state hospital complained about having to use expired respirators, they alleged that staff were ordered to remove stickers showing the equipment was years out of date. Which I can understand why they would put that equipment into hospitals and why they would even remove those stickers. Because there is such a shortage of respirators going on right now that people are in a mad scramble trying to retrofit factories to produce it, trying to retrofit scuba gear to work and function as respirators, trying to retrofit... I think there was windshield wipers and the, the machinery behind windshield wipers and automobiles to like just rip it out of the automobile and pack it into being a working respirator because that's one of the limiting things in what could cost so many lives in here in North America and, and is already starting to cost lives in play, big cities like, for example, New York City, is just not enough respirators being available. So it's understandable if they're using kind of old and broken down ones, though. So at another hospital just east of Seattle, nurses had to use face shields indefinitely, uh, which I'm sure is not how they're designed to be used. Continuing on, the counts of nurses were drawn from nine complaints filed by the Washington State Nurses Association with the State Department of Labor and Industries since March 11th. They paint a picture of how the first state hit by COVID continues to struggle, 
the Muda. So there's Cargo May preview what medical providers in other states and probably here in Canada, I will point out, could face amid a national shortage of personal protective equipment or PPE. The complaints from Washington also show an increasing sense of fear, frustration, and powerlessness many nurses and other medical workers feel as COVID-19 pummels the healthcare system. Uh, as of this weekend, the Washington Department of Health has reported 3,700 known cases and 175 deaths. So when was this? This was March 28th. So this is yesterday. Okay. So ProPublica contacted all nine hospitals that were the subject of nursing association complaint. Complaint? Should probably be complaints, but whatever. Four responded. They were taking measures to protect their employees, but emphasized that the unprecedented crisis in which their hospital staffs are now working. Blah, blah, blah. The quote, Jay Inslee said the federal government has supplied the state with significant shipments of personal protective equipment, but added that profound long-term concerns about being able to procure these necessities. Well, that didn't really make sense. Anyway, there's another thing that I wanted to kind of pull out of here. Oh, here we are. The nurses believe they have no choice but to keep working at great personal risk and with limited means to raise concern within the chains of command. They could be disciplined for talking to the media, and some said they had been explicitly warned about that in emails sent by hospital administrators. But to refuse an assignment on safety grounds, they could, could find them as ostracized by colleagues or worse, fired for insubordination. Quote, it's a healthcare war zone. It basically goes on and on about how they are not providing protection that nurses expect, and the nurses know better than practically anyone what they need to be protected from this thing. And they're not getting it. And they're basically being told kind of like soldiers, oh, you know what you were signed up for when you became a nurse? Uh, quote, it's the stuff of fairy tales. Nurses administratively are strongly discouraged to use the forms or outright shame for documenting what they're uncomfortable with in a caregiving situation. And, oh, here we are. So that they're being given the cloth masks, which people are, are making for them, which is nice that people are trying to do this, but, quote, one registered nurse wrote, we need to be able to wear something. Whereas another wrote, quote, no offense, but I'm not wearing someone's arts and craft project with this thing. And then it kind of goes into more of the details of how deeply behind they are, how the protective equipment is not there for them and how the kind of more more of the same where the each it's, it's not just one hospital it's not just one nurse who's who's complaining and then the other nurses are kind of working around her or something like that this is an endemic problem uh, inherent in the situation the nurses are encountering or shortcomings or lack of equipment and they're trying to take it up the chain of command and being blocked now, this is the sort of thing that WikiLeaks exists for. So if you out there listening know of any of these nurses, get them in contact with WikiLeaks because this is the sort of information that the world needs to know about and actually may impact how other regions deal with the crisis. So from the peanut gallery, quote, apparently staff are stealing a lot of supplies. And this I've heard from not just multiple sources here in Saskatoon relating to the, the healthcare system here, but around North America, that there's a lot of reports of equipment going missing and a lot of reports that nurses are, are being left without important equipment, things like N95 masks that are going to be necessary for some of them to be even alive. If enough nurses get sick, the nurses are going to start to die. And never mind the nurses not being able to treat people, we're going to lose nurses. And that's a, a big loss. I mean, anyone dying is a, a loss, but again, there's only so many nurses to go, to go around. And we're already short on nurses. So it's, it's a huge deal that we're kind of, Facebook just changed their uh, interface for this video thing. So I'm like looking for the time to see where I am in this video. But uh, anyway, it's a bad situation and it can get worse if we don't know how bad it is. And the way that we would not know how bad it is is for administrators to lock down on nurses being able to report these bad things happening. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up is because I did get into an argument with from someone from the Saskatchewan Health uh, Authority, the SHA, if I'm getting that acronym right, where they were claiming that there were memos going around before the outbreak really took off here. And they were saying, oh, don't worry, it's not a problem, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. One of the memos did actually wind up leaking to the CBC. Uh, I think I may have mentioned it last week. But what's important to note 
is they are showing signs of this kind of control over their nurses. And maybe this is just the way things have always been here in Saskatchewan. Maybe this is the way that our healthcare system works, is that our nurses, when they encounter problems, are not able to report them. And for the most part, people just sort of live or possibly don't live with the consequences. But I think the consequences here are going to be a lot bigger and a lot more acute and a lot easier to get totally out of control if we don't talk about them. And so if the media is not able to cover it, the media is not able to bring it to the attention of the people who could actually make a change in policy, then that's a problem. And so that's something that we're going to have to watch out for here in Saskatchewan. So, but before I get too much further into the news, uh, because I did have a whole bunch of, or actually had one guest lined up that I thought was for sure, and then one that I was really, really hoping on, uh, and nobody's uh, stepped up to the plate today. I'm going to have some songs, as kind of I usually do. Uh, one of them is actually one of mine. I was thinking of actually playing this one uh, to do kind of like another take, but I, I'm just not feeling it today. <laughs> Sorry. And then the other one, unfortunately, I don't know the artist. Uh, this is another one from the GNU Funk Radio, uh, is identified by the station ID that's going to play right away. So if you know of what this artist is, uh, please let me know, because I really, really like it, and I'd love to hear some more of it. And it's actually very appropriate to this this week. So uh, hopefully you enjoy these two songs, and then we'll get back to the show.
you keep breathing And I'll keep on the move Keep sucking down the key And try not to be I'm still here for you But like whatever man It's just what I do Just try to understand Make sure COVID's locked so Your family sees you again So again, that was Like Whatever Man, I recorded a couple of days ago, it's for the nurses, so if you know any nurses in your life, uh, feel free to send that to them, that is for them. And I am, I did actually practice that today, so I do intend on doing more with that, and I have some ideas for that, but I will go into that perhaps at another time after I actually do it. So, in the meanwhile, what else has been going on in the world? 
and in this area of Saskatchewan. This is from the CBC, which usually I don't like linking to the CBC, but they covered it before anyone else did, which is, quote, the government to review canceled City of Regina emergency order. So the timeline basically went here. The COVID crisis started. The Saskatchewan government laughed at the NDP for suggesting that it might be a big deal and that they may have to actually act on it. And then at some point, the city of Regina started realizing how big of a deal it was and declared a state of emergency and did things like uh, mandating uh, certain uh, businesses would close. And let's see if they actually have some of the details on that in this article. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the town of Gravelberg also made their own emergency declaration. Yeah, they, they mostly just talk about the Saskatchewan restrictions that were already in place or shortly after or before uh, one or the other uh, happened. But th the important part here is the city of Regina actually was doing the right thing, at least as far as flattening the curve and taking measures as soon as they could to make changes into the way people lived in Regina, an area, and enforce them with the power of the law. And the response from the Saskatchewan party at the Saskatchewan government level was to undo this law and this, this declaration at the city level. And they may even be correct that the city didn't actually have the authority to do that and that the provincial government has to be the one to do it, to do things like, let's see here, uh, having 14-day isolation period or self-isolation periods for people traveling to Regina from foreign countries like the United States that are having their own outbreaks right now. And But regardless of the legal obligation and the constitutionality of it, now is not the time to be nitpicking about what level of government has the authority over what particular part of the law. The important part was that Regina go on lockdown and that the level of government take the initiative and actually lead the country in trying to do something about COVID-19. And Regina, to their credit, actually stepped up to the plate. I didn't think it had it in it. The mayor of Regina is not someone I'm really all that impressed with normally, but they did. And they did enough that the Saskatchewan party government had to do this. So the net result of this is going to be people in Regina are going to die because of the actions of the SAS party in allowing this to spread up until that point. Now, since then, uh, the Saskatchewan government has restricted more and more. And so maybe the damage at that particular day, it will have to know two weeks from, uh, what, was it? what was the day this happened, the 22nd. So we're one week after that. We still have another week to see what exactly the consequences of that due to the fact that there's a two-week delay period with COVID-19 between being exposed and getting the, the first real symptoms. Uh, which, uh, another thing I'm, I'm just going to point out here, with all this free time on my hands being self-isolated, I have decided to take a course on epidemiology offered by Coursera. And so far it's a pretty good course. The, the tests are fiendishly difficult. But the, the important thing here is that there are scientists out there that do this for a living and to model and try to understand uh, diseases like COVID-19 and to see what could be done uh, and what policy is appropriate. And re in this case, Regina was following the advice way, way further ahead than the Saskatchewan government at the time. And the Saskatchewan government stepped in and prevented them from doing the right thing. So that's kind of an unfortunate turn of events on that side. Let's see what else we got here. One interesting article came from Reporters Without Borders. Quote, coronavirus, the information heroes China silenced. And there's this big uh, media and propaganda war going on right now uh, between a bunch of different actors and a bunch of different groups that are trying to control the narrative of how we think about China's role in this particular crisis. Now, this specifically is for the from the perspective of the, the journalists and the scientists who tried to point out something was wrong and tried within China to make it clear to the world and the rest of China that there was a crisis unfolding. So, quote, as journalistic freedom has been reduced to the barest minimum within China's traditional media, it's ordinary citizens who usually step into the breach in some, such cases. In this case, the first was Li Wenyang, an ophthalmologist at Wuhan Central Hospital, where the first coronavirus cases were seen in November. Although no one understood the nature of the illness at the time, Li was the first to blow the whistle on the possibility of a coronavirus pandemic. 
So Dr. Lee was like many Ch within the Chinese population who want to report the reality of what is going on and alert their fellow citizens about government negligence, said Daniel Bastard, uh, the head of the RSF's Asia Pacific desk. And continuing on, quote, the coronavirus crisis has drawn attention to the deep thirst for reliable information within Chinese society, which is saturated with propaganda. Uh, Xi Jinping's government has responded with deadly brutality. Armed with a photo of a test, Li spoke about the ongoing epidemic for the first time on 30th December with former faculty of medicine students in private discussion groups on the messaging service WeChat. The alarm was sounded. His messages were shared very widely on microblogging website Weibo, but they were also seen by authorities. Two days later, on the 1st of January, Li and seven other doctors were questioned. Li was grilled for several hours and on the 3rd of January, police forced him to sign a statement recognizing that he had spread, quote, false rumors, unquote. So after testing positive for COVID-19 on the 1st of February, the young doctor died in the early hours of the 7th of February. And then kind of in celebration of his uh, commitment and attempt to bring this to the world. They also include, quote, Chen Kui Shi, if I'm pronouncing that right, a lawyer from the far northeast province of, if I'm pronouncing this right, Haimongjiang, uh, who made a name for himself in the Chinese blogosphere with videos of demonstrations in Hong Kong uh, that he had shot a few months earlier. Uh, he boarded a train to Wuhan on 23rd of January in order to get his information at the source. But what kind of journalist would you be if you didn't dare go to the front line? He asked in a video shot outside of Wuhan's Hanko, if I'm pronouncing that right, station. In the following days, Shen was, went around the city's hospitals covering the chaos interviewing the families of the victims and visited an exhibition center turned into a quarantine zone. His videos were viewed by hundreds of thousands of people, despite being quickly censored on Weibo and WeChat. Which, by the way, there's a lot of people these days, especially in the NDP circles, I'm noticing, who are using TikTok. And TikTok is under the same control, Weibo and WeChat. It is something that the Chinese government can use to keep this kind of information from spreading. And as I'm learning in my epidemiology course, it is crucially important that doctors be able to share information about symptoms, how many patients are being affected, and basic idea of what the situation on the ground is. Because Doctors need to compare notes to get a good idea of what exactly they are facing so that they can enact policy measures that are appropriate to the situation. And not providing this to the rest of the world, China is really doing a disservice to not just the rest of the world, but to itself. It is losing the ability to, to meaningfully react to the threat that a pandemic poses, again, not just the world, but China itself. There are rumors that some of the death numbers are not accurate and that they are much, much higher than they are currently being reported. It is very, very difficult to discount these rumors given the heavy-handed censorship that is going on in China right now. And in particular, the lack of freedom of expression and freedom of journalists and freedom of whistleblowers in China and in the United States is really doing a disservice to our ability to meaningfully deal with this crisis. And when governments like in China, but also in the United States and in Canada, start talking about further restriction on the freedom to communicate, the freedom to blow the whistle, the freedom to provide the public with meaningful information, as well as the freedom to communicate with sources. Uh, that is one of the things going on in the United States right now, is the Earn IT Act is slowly making its way through Congress, an attempt to ban the use of safe communication technology the, to ban the use of crypto that the U.S. government does not have one of the keys for. The details are a little bit more complicated, but that is the, the essence of what they're trying to do. And they're trying to do it under the, the fog of war or under the fog of this crisis where everyone has focused their attention on surviving as a country of putting out the fires of spending trillions of dollars a day to try to keep the market afloat, there's a lot of things to pay attention on this week. And so the Earn IT Act being pushed through the states, and who knows, maybe they'll try it here in Canada if they, after they do that, that has a direct impact here because journalists not being able to have a secure from the government's 
listening line of communication with doctors means that doctors can't get the word out if there's a pandemic or if there's signs of pandemic or if we start seeing things like symptoms that are out of season that is just something that they should be able to tell journalists so that other doctors around the world can then securely read and not be interfered with by a government preventing them from learning this and this sounds crazy it sounds paranoid it sounds like no government would ever do that that's exactly what they're doing in china right now and it's exactly what they're talking about doing in the united states right now it's exactly what they're doing the the infrastructure is in place in places like australia already to on a technical level uh require it and on a legal level as well so this is something that is moving it's not here yet the earn it act has not passed if you're an american you can still stand up to your your government uh, officials to try to get them to stop pushing this but it is something that is happening this week so what else is going on we've got uh oh right and so you think with all of this going on with the economy and a tailspin uh the people starting to die in really large numbers across the world and even in Canada starting to die in the dozens with a shortage of basic medical equipment like N95 masks and ventilators a shortage of nurses across the board and people with the skills to run ventilators a all of these deep problems that are coming to a head in the healthcare system and outside of the healthcare system and what is the SAS party working on here in Saskatchewan let's go to this link see what exactly they're spending their time on here in Saskatchewan with all of the things that they could be doing with all of the problems in the healthcare system needing immediate attention and they are talking about giving bits of Wascana Park in Regina to the friends and donors of the SAS party of all the things they could be worried about this is this is what's going on and so, uh, unfortunately, it's a video. So this quote last week, the SAS party used a majority uh, to shut down the NDP resolution to scrap their giveaway of Wascana Parkland to one of their donors against the will of the people of Regina, which I believe the people of Regina would n never consent to this sort of thing being given away. Although I guess maybe some SAS party supporters might, but it's just bizarre to read something like this because again, this is in the midst of a global crisis of unprecedented seriousness and this is what they're spending their time doing their corruption is so important to them that the lives of the people here in saskatchewan are not worth it for them to be dealing with that as their issue no they have to be worrying about how they can get their friends just that little bit richer so the peanut gallery is saying are you working on covid protein folding i my computer is working on covid protein folding but purely by accident I didn't set it up. I didn't know how or where to look to set it up, but I checked and it turned out that uh, the particular uh, service of Boink uh, Rosetta at home that I'm using is actually doing COVID related stuff right now. So if you have a computer that's not currently doing protein folding, consider going to Rosetta at home. I'll try to have a link. Or uh, I think folding at home, Stan Stanford's folding at home also is doing COVID related stuff right now. So your computer in its spare time when you're not using it maybe with like a screensaver or something could be doing work to understand how proteins fold uh, the particular proteins involved in COVID-19 and its infection and so that there are some open problems in how that not just that virus but our immune system responds as far as the the proteins and just in general some some of the basic questions are, are still open you wouldn't expect that as basic questions as there are still open, but there they are. So I'm gonna try to leave a link for that. And other than that, I think that's it for today. So hopefully next week we'll have a little bit better news, but this week is still pretty dire as far as this COVID-19 situation goes. So I'm gonna fade out with the goodbye song and hopefully I will see you all next week. We'll see you tomorrow, but in the meanwhile,